Welcome to the Kingsway Christian Fellowship Sermon Podcast. We are streaming live from Karam Downs in Melbourne, Australia. Kingsway Christian Fellowship is a non-denominational, Bible-believing, and preaching church. We believe the Bible is the inherent Word of God and preach it verse by verse. You can follow us at www.kingswaycf.com and follow our video sermons. Now, join us as we listen to the latest sermon preached by Pastor John Shipman. Now, when we come to a book and when we study the Word of God, there is a threefold application that I want to bring to your attention. First of all, I want you to understand that there was a local application. What does it mean? It means that John literally walked on the earth and he established a church. There was a few churches that John actually opened up. He went, and like Paul, he also started a few churches. Um, And there was local people there. In this particular case, one of the churches that, uh, that John established, there was a split in the church. And who knows that splits happens in churches? And it happened then as well. But it was for the wrong reason that the people left that church. I mean, if you open up in uh, 1 John chapter one, 2 verse 19, he says that those people who went out from us was never part of us. They came and they just sat around and they were in the church but they were never part of the calling of God. And this is why you will find in some churches, those who are truly born again and called by God and who's got the anointing of God, and then you will have other people just coming to the church by association. And association could be as easy as, my husband goes to church and now I've got to go to church. And then you go because your husband go or your children go or your wife go. And by just going to church, there's something that's going to happen. Your life will change. Just by going to church. Because you associate with people. And the people that you hang around with, soon enough you will pick up their habits. Who knows that? This is why we should not hang out with the wrong crowd. This is what our parents always told us, isn't it? Don't hang out with the wrong crowd. And it's also true with church. If you start hanging out in church... You can go through your whole life in church, but never be born again. I'll say that again. There's people who are sitting in churches who are not born again, not truly saved. And this is what happened in those local applications. So back in the day, he wrote this letter and he sent it to them. But then there's also a prophetic application of the whole Bible. The whole Bible is a prophecy. Who knows that? The whole Bible, not only the prophecies in the Bible. What is the prophetic application of this letter? It was written for our day and age. A lot of the things that he wrote already happened. And a lot of the things that you will find as we're going to go through this book, verse by verse, is still to happen. He's talking about antichrists. He's talking about the antichrist. So there's a lot of things that's going to happen. So first, you've got a local application, then you've got a prophetic application, and this is the one you need to listen to now. Then you have a personal application. What is the personal application? You need to look at this letter, and you need to read it, and then you need to ask the question, so what? What is it for me? What is it telling me personally? When you come to Sundays, I want you to do that. What am I going to learn today from the Word of God? This is written for me. God has directed your footsteps to be in this building, a funeral home, on this Sunday. It's strange, isn't it? To come and to learn something. And this is what He's addressing here. You always need to say that. Why is this written? For whom is is this written? And so what? This is what I'm going to address. You see, because this is a wonderful letter. I don't know who has studied through the first letter of John, but it is so deep and so comprehensive that you can spend your whole life just studying the letter of John. It is so powerful. Uh, I was sitting there during the week, and as I prepare, you you know how it works for me. I've got a full-time job. I know that at work. But then... Uh, As soon as I finish this sermon, already next week's sermon is already starting to brew in me. You know that brewing effect? 
And then during the week, I get a scripture verse, I pray, I meditate, I do the self-study so that God fill me up as well. And then as you go through the week, there's more verses coming, more verses coming. And I'm going to do to you today what I do normally in my studies. I take a passage, I read through the passage of the Bible, and then there's maybe something that sticks out to me, and I take that word or that phrase, and I start going into my, my concordance, and I follow up on this one thing, and I go on a rabbit trail because of one word in this. And you know I get hooked up on words sometimes, and then I go on this, this rabbit trail, and then I open up another verse over here, and as I study that verse over there, there's another word that stands out for me, which is so powerful, and then I, I pull, you know, literally on pieces of paper, I put an arrow down there, and then I start digging into that other word and then I lose myself in the Bible. Is that you? Have you ever studied the Bible like that? Yes. It is wonderful. It is amazing. I find myself going there, then I go there, then I go there, and then I go here and then I sit back and I say, Lord, I'm lost. Where did I start? <laughs> where, where is this? And then I follow the arrows back and I go, oh, this is the passage. Oh, yes, Lord, okay. But this is the wonderful thing that I learned from that. I am so much more richer for this rabbit trail that I took down here. So I'm just going to take you today on a few of my rabbit trails, okay? Is that okay with you? I was going to do it anyway. You knew that. <laughs> so I want to talk to you today as an intro into this letter because we're going to go through these letters verse by verse. But today I'm going to talk about these things. These things. And it's fascinating if you take some color-coded uh, pens and you go through the letter of John and you just highlight some of the things that he re repeats. That you can build Bible studies and sermons just out of the repetitions that he do. It is a fascinating letter. I hope, you know, why are you so excited about this this morning, Pastor? I hope out of my excitement, I can get you to get excited. Will you get excited today? No, not just because I said it, but I hope the Word of God makes you alive. So here it is today, I want to talk about these things. And, and the reason why I start this way is, I want to come to this letter and say, why did you write these things to us, to the personal application, to the church in Karen Downs in the year 2023? So John, Holy Spirit, why did you write this letter? And here we go. In John, 1 John chapter 1 verse 4, we find one of these reasons. He says, and these things, everybody say these things. That's plural, isn't it? He says, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So there's one thing that I will know that if you open up in the letters of John and you read this letter over and over and over again, maybe 10 or 20 times, that you're going to be joyful. This letter is going to make you joyful. It's going to fill up your joy. But whenever you read these words, you need to understand what things is he talking about. And this is me now starting to dig in. What things are you talking about, John? Well, first of all, when we come in the early part of the letter, he's referring to fellowship here. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 3, he says the following. He says, that which we have seen, which we have heard, we declare to you. You see that? We declare this to you, that you also may have fellowship. Everybody say fellowship. What is fellowship? Fellowship is koinonia. Fellowship is what we have here in the church as, as we come together as brothers and sisters. Who enjoy church? Is it a joy for you to come on Sundays? I couldn't wait. I was like a little boy last night. Ask Leone. You know, one more sleep, and here we are, we're in church. You know, is, is the Word of God, is your brothers and sisters your joy? Brothers and sisters, if you leave the church today not with joy in your heart, come and see me. We desperately need to pray that the Lord open up your joy gate. And, and you know what is the joy gate? You're going to find it in Christ. Not in the church, but in Christ. This is what he says there. He says that you have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship... He's talking now about the fellowship of the apostles. Is with whom? The Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That is 
the foundation of your joy. Not worshipping the church. Sorry, worship team. Well, I'm part of the worship team, so I can say that. Not, not you know, whatever goes on in a church. Not the building. No, no. It is Jesus Christ and the Father and fellowship with Him that brings us, brothers and sisters, joy. This is the things He's talking about. How is your fellowship this morning? You need to come to church because you want to see the brethren and sistren. You want to see the sistren. And you want to walk in and you want to go. And I love it in this church because I see it. I want to go over to Bree and say, Hey, Bree, how are you? Not because I'm stiff or something, but because I'm generally interested in how you are going. Are you generally interested in your brothers and sisters? If we are, we will then see the needs in them. And, and listen to me now. When you supply to the needs of somebody who is needed, guess what it brings you? Joy! I've learned it. When I was young, it was always nice to get a, a gift, isn't it? A present. But the older I get, it's more joyful to give than to receive. Amen. Now, who's learned that? So this is where you find it. The fellowship of the church. Hey, John, why do you write this letter to us? First of all, you all people there, brethren and sistren in Karim Downs, that your joy may be full. How do our joy become full? When you fellowship with one another and our fellowship is with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this is what I do on a paper. Then I scratch down because another verse came, comes up. Psalm 133 verse 1. He says, Behold. Everybody say, Behold. Behold. It makes a statement. He says, How good and how pleasant is it for brethren and sistren. For brethren to dwell together in unity. In unity. This is why. If you want joy, don't go and find the joy in the world. We will talk about it next week. But don't look in the world. Don't look at your finances. Don't look at your lifestyle. Find joy in Jesus Christ. Where are you going to find Him? I hope you find Him in the church that you go to. I hope so. At some churches, He's standing at the door and He's knocking. He's trying to come in. But here He is in the midst of us. You see, if we do this, if we are in unity and if we are pleasant together and we fellowship with one another and we fellowship with the Father and we fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, guess what you're going to get? Joy! It is as simple as that. The Bible is not complicated. Now this is a personal application. This is for you. Turn to the person next to you and say, this is for you. Come on. So then, then we say, and this is only going by the repetitions that John do. Okay, you see, this is what you find in church. If you say, turn to the person, and then they get their address, they ask them how they were, and all of these kind of things. Just do what the pastor asks you, okay? <laughs> but here we go. So we use this as a repetition word. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. Then we find another one in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. If you've got your Bible here, open up there and mark this. He says, my little children. I love it when John writes that. My little children. These things, these things, you see, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. This is a wonderful verse. Have you ever seen this verse in your life? If this is the first time you see this verse, I praise the Lord for that. But maybe you've read it and it was never opened for you. This, is, this verse is a verse. If somebody asks you and say, how do you know that you are born again? You open up here you say, because I've got an advocate. Who knows what's an advocate? It's somebody who stands up in your place. And he puts your case before the master. And here he says, my little children, we write to you that you may not sin. But who knows that even Christians do sin? Who knows that? You know, I, I never preach a sinless perfection. And those people who preach it, well, they are just genuinely, they don't know what they preach. 
Because, you know, Paul says, O wretched man that I am. What tense is that? Present tense. Who will save me from this body of sin? No, no, you will stop sinning when you are glorified. Who knows what is, what is it when you get glorified? That's when you die. And then you go in and be with the Lord if you are saved. If not, you go to hell. Sorry to say that, but it's true. But here he says it. He says, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. So that you're going to find in the letter of John a lot of uh, indications that you do not sin. He says, but if you sin, you have got an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. You see, this is where it goes back to 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. He says, if we confess our sins, what happened? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, he says to us here, he writes to us a personal application. He says to you people there in Karim Downs, I write to you this that you do not sin. That's the point. That's the first bar that you go from. Start going away from sin. You need to discipline your mind and your body to go away from sin. Now listen to me clearly. This is not works plus salvation or faith. No, no. This is the works that happens after the cross. Once you are born again now, once you are saved by Christ and you're a child of God, you need to discipline your body and your mind not to sin. But if it happens, he says, we have an advocate which we need to go to and we pray for forgiveness. My brother said it this morning again. He said, you know, if we sin, what do we do with that sin? Do you cover it? I think three Sundays from now I'm going to show you how people cover their sin. You see? And I will show you that people who cover their sin, they won't prosper. You say, why is those people are prospering and we don't prosper? Well, you're covering your sin. Wait, I'm already advertising three weeks in advance, brother. <laughs> but this is what he writes. He says, first of all, I write these things to you so that your joy may be full. Secondly, I write to you so that you do not sin. And if you do sin, if you read through my letters, you will understand that you've got an advocate. And that advocate is not the best lawyer in Melbourne. It's not the best lawyer in Australia or in New Zealand or in the world. That lawyer's name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. The anointed one is our advocate. Yeshua is salvation, is our advocate. How wonderful is it to have Him as your advocate? And how much does it cost you to have Him as your advocate? Who knows that lawyers' bills can be very expensive? Who knows that? This advocate comes to you and he says, I've paid the price for you. So that you don't have to pay. You don't have to pay a penny. How privileged are we? So John, why do you write the letter? I'll give you a third one. 1 John chapter 2 verse 26. You see again, I'm just using the words which is repeated. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Those who try to deceive you. He had a split in one of his churches. There were people coming into the church and they gave a different gospel. They gave a false gospel. They were false preachers. They are around. If you are sitting in this church today and say, Nah, you know, everybody who preaches the word is good. No, no. You need to test the word. There are false teachers out there. You need to test their, their agendas when they preach the word of God. Some people are doing it for fame. Some people are doing it for money. Some people are doing it to build big, mighty churches. Some pastors like to see them on the front pages of the magazines. Some pastors like it, you know, when they open up in YouTube to see, I've got over 20,000 views. Woohoo! It means nothing. It means nothing if you are not preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You may have a following, but you may have that following going with you to a place where you don't want to be. Amen. So this is important. This is important to look into. He writes to them because there is people, or there are people out there who's trying to deceive you. The word deceive there comes from the Greek word planahu, which means to lead you aside from the right way to the wrong way. That's what they do. They will come into a church like this. 
And I'll tell you why they won't succeed in this church. Because we preach the word of God here in spirit and truth. There's no stories that we preach here. There's no books that we preach here. We preach the book of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible. And I've seen them coming over the years, brothers and sisters. I've seen them in New Zealand. We've pioneered two churches. They come in, they try to pull the pastor aside, and they try to influence the pastor. If they can't influence him, they go to the flock. And where, you know where they go? They go to the weakest one. And who is the weakest one in the flock? The one who don't study his Bible. The one who's not standing in the Word of God. They go to them and, and they try to get that one. If they get one, they can get two, they can get three. And soon they've got a crowd and they cause a rebellion. This is what they do. And he writes this. He writes this. He says, be careful for the ones who come to try and deceive you. You see, here I go again with my sketches. You're going to see a lot of that today. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, he says, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? If anybody denies that Jesus is the Christ, he is a liar. Now, what is Christ? The anointed one. So these people who come and knock on your door, I saw them, I was at home on Friday morning, and you, see, you know these, these people who come and knock the witnesses? They come and they knock on your door. They deny that Jesus is Christ. What are they? They are liars. Islam denies that Jesus Christ is Lord. What are they? They are liars. Who's saying it? Me? Don't come after me. Come after the Word of God. He says that they are liars. He is an antichrist who denies, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son, does not, uh, the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son is the Father also. Now I brought along today my big Bible. Okay? Now I, I normally do Bible bashing when I use, when I want to do Bible bashing, I use this Bible. <laughs> Who knows what's Bible bashing? <laughs> if you're not going to listen to me, brother, boom! Oh, I better watch out my shoulder. <laughs> I took some strong medicine. I can do that. <laughs> so I brought this Bible along for this reason. When I came to this, and I, you know how Sunday after Sunday I come to you and I say to you that the English is just a translation. We need to go back to the Greek. Because when I read this, I said, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. I don't like that. Because there's a lot of people who acknowledge Jesus Christ. If you go to the Muslim, they acknowledge Him. They acknowledge Him. If you go to the Jehovah Witness, they acknowledge Him. But acknowledge is not the right word. So I went into my interlinear big Bible bashing Bible... And I thought, look, Lord, I want to read it out of this to get a better perspective on it. And, uh, you know, you're welcome afterwards to come and have a look into it. I don't like to make marks in this Bible because it's really thin writing. But I'll read it to you, that verse, out of this Bible, okay? And you will see why I came to the point where I said there that I will replace in the New, New King James translation that word with the word confess. Because there's a difference. There's a difference. There's a difference in acknowledging something and confessing something. Okay? And this is why. Let me read it to you out of this Bible. Verse 22. This is how it reads. It. You see the, the, the sentence starts with it. Who is the liar except the one denying that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one denying the Father and the Son. And everyone denying the Son, neither the Father has the one confessing the Son, also has the Father and the Son. So what is the real translation saying? The word there is confess. So if you've got a New King James Bible, scratch that out in your Bible and write in the word confess. I thought that was really important. And this is why it's always important to go back to the Scriptures. You are welcome to come and have a look at that Bible. Is that opening up something for you? Yes. We need to confess the Lord Jesus Christ. If we deny the Son and the Father, 
We are all but just liars. We are just liars. Now, those are the reasons why he writes this letter to us. First of all, for us to have joy. And then, secondly, we need to, we need to have fellowship one, with one another. And then, what was the second one? We say, he write it so that we know that if we sin, we have an advocate. And then, thirdly, he wrote to us that these things, so that no one can deceive you. And if they deceive you, we know that they are liars. So now I want to just turn over and ask you, and I, I'm, I'm going to actually explain to you the reasons why this letter is written. Look at this one here. I've lost my way a bit. That's not working out well. Right, let's look at the reasons for this letter. There's a few reasons that he writes this. He says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, these things, again, he says these things. Again, all I did is I went to the repetitions. He says, I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. This to me is one of the most important verses in your Bible. Why? Because this gives us assurance of salvation. Who's got assurance of salvation? The Bible talks about that. John writes to us here. This is the fourth one. He says, these things I've written to you who believe. You, have you noticed he didn't say and believe and did some works? No, no. He says, who believes in the name of the Son of God that you may know. Everybody say that you may know. That you, may know. you have what? Eternal life. And that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. You see, all the things in this letter, all the these things that comes together, makes us to know who Jesus is. And we know what a Christian is. If you're going to read before this, if you read in, in chapter 5, from verse 1 to 5, he's going to show you who Jesus is. If we read the next verses on, which we will get to, we're going to see who a Christian is. And he writes all these things for us so that we know that if we believe in the name of the Son of God, we have eternal life. If we look at eternal life there, it is really interesting to see that it gives us the assurance of that eternal life, of salvation. Eternal life is a gift. We, we receive this as a gift from God. This gift is a person. Who knows that? Jesus Christ, this eternal life is a person. And in this person is life eternal. And if you have this person, you have that life. And His name is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. That is the whole theme of John when he writes in the Gospels. I love it. In the Gospels, John gives us a reason why he writes the Gospels. John chapter 20 verse 30, he writes there, he says, These things I've written to you, so that if you believe in the Son of God, you are saved. You've got eternal life. He comes down here to his letter in John 5, 13. He says, I've written this to you, that if you believe in the name of the Son of God, you have eternal life. If you open up in Revelation, also what John wrote, he said, Blessed are those who read this revelation. So there's a few reasons why he wrote this letter to us. And we're going to open it up in the next few weeks. But for the rest of the time, I just want to give you three main themes now through the gospel or through this letter of John. The first one is this one in 1 John chapter 1 verse 5. This is a great theme. He says, this is the message which we have heard from him. And we declare that to you. That God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Now this slide is going to become very busy right now. You know what we learn? God is light. You understand what it means when we say that God is light? A definition for light is a natural agent that stimulates sight, and makes things visible. That is what light is. If you open it up in a dictionary. I did. And I found this definition. It's a natural agent. We've got a natural agent today, don't we? It's called the sun. 
when the sun came up this morning, what happened? It stimulates our sight in our eyes so that we may see things. If I make this whole room dark and you keep your eyes open and it's pitch dark, you will see nothing because your eyes won't be stimulated to see anything until I bring a light into the room. So if we look at this, it's really interesting. Light is the nature and the character of God. It doesn't say God is trying to be light. It doesn't say God is like a light. He's not saying it's like some kind of light. No, no. God is light itself. Think about that. That's part of His character. And now, John says to us, in Him is no darkness at all. There's no darkness in God. We can't comprehend this. Because we see both. God is the only infinite, uh, infinite, He's the only infinite light, eternal and unchangeable, perfect in whom all things begin and continue and end. That's who God is. God is light. It is so powerful. You see, darkness is the absence of light. And it represents everything that is anti-God darkness. If I bring darkness into this room, what happens? Nothing. But if I, again, if I put all of the lights out and I close all of the windows, like some churches do, by the way, but if we close it all and I bring a light into the room, what happens? Darkness goes out. So darkness is right here, is the absence of light. But it's also, in the Bible, represent anti-God. In Proverbs chapter 2 verse 15 he says, who leave the paths of righteous uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. So we see darkness when it is operating in somebody's life, there is no light at all. And this is how we all were born in darkness. Sin is darkness. Operating in sin is darkness. And here John writes to us, he says, one of the themes that we're going to find through this letter is that God is light and there's no darkness in Him at all. Look at John chapter 1 verse 4. If you go to the Gospels, he says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of the men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Amen? Darkness can't comprehend it. It's not as if darkness comes in. And overshadow the light. So what do we need? We need the light of Christ. We need the light to shine in our lives. I love this verse in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2. And I know for the ones at the back it's a little bit low here. But I'll read it to you. In Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 he says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them have the light shined. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Why do you say that? Because we were those people in darkness. Now specifically, he was talking here about Samaria. In this verse here was a prophecy about Samaria. And it came to fulfillment in John chapter 4. When Jesus Christ visited Samaria. This is when this light came into the shadow of death. It came into the, light, the darkness. So, John is writing to us here in this letter that God is light. So, you're sitting here this morning and you say, Preacher, so what? What has that got to do with me? Brothers and sisters, you need the light of Christ in your life. You know, there's a song that somebody sings, I've seen the light, I've seen the light, no more darkness, yeah? If you are sitting here today and there's darkness in your life, that's sin. It keeps you away from God. It keeps you away from the light. But once that light shines, oh man, sin runs away. Now we've had a steakhouse in South Africa for 10 years. And that's why I look the way I look, Bree. You know, I love my food, I said before. But we've had a steakhouse and there's these little cockroaches that runs around there, isn't it? Every steakhouse I've got them. I, I can tell you that. And they love the warm places. And they love to go under the fridges. And they just sit there. You can't see them. You turn on the light and you walk around, you can't see them. Why? Because they hide in the dark. 
Now, well, I've felt it so many times. When we go there after a night and you open up the place in the morning, and, and the place was dark. We made it dark for ambience. And as you open up the door and the light comes in, you literally can see in the kitchen them run. I know. Praise the Lord, there's none, none over here. And now, the, now they say that, you know, we're going to start eating bucks. Hopefully not those bucks. <laughs> This is what the government is bringing, okay? Stop eating your nice meat, your steak. We're going to give you some bucks to eat. It tastes just like meat. Don't believe it. <laughs> but you know, we open up that door and all of a sudden you see them all running, running. Where do they run to? They run for the darkness. Sin does that. So once a year when we go on holiday, we used to drive all the way down from Johannesburg to Durban. It's an eight-hour drive. We close the place down for three, three weeks and what do we do? We've got these gas bombs and we put them in, lock the door, gas bomb it and we go away for three weeks. We come back and it looks like Armageddon. <laughs> this is everywhere. And you know what we think? We got rid of them. <laughs> but it's keep on coming back. Brothers and sisters, do not allow the little cockroaches of sin in your life to fester and to keep on festering. Because you come to church, and church is like that gas bomb maybe for you. And you walk out of here and you go, I've got rid of that. Watch out for that because it's festering once and for all. Turn to the Lord and say, Lord, help me with the Holy Spirit to become disciplined and not sin. Not to let these things fester. The only things that will bring it Bring it into the light, is the light. And then he will take care of that. So God is light. You know, I, I can't wait for us to get into this later next week because there's a blessing in that. You see the second one, and this is a great one because this one the whole week I was meditating on. The second one is God is righteousness. God is righteousness. Look at 1 John 2 verse 29. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. As we're going to study through this later, we will come to this passage and we'll go deeper. But this word righteousness is a powerful word. Man, this was lying on my head this whole week. I even went to Facebook with this. <laughs> because I was so blessed. God is righteous. And because God is righteous, and we are born again, what needs to happen with us? We need to become righteous. But see how he puts this. What is that word? Practice righteousness. That means it's something we need to do. Yes or no? Is this works? It's not faith and plus faith that works that's going to save you, but this is works after you are saved. Practices righteousness. You see, this is interesting. Because Psalm 145 verse 17 says the following. He says, The Lord is righteous in all His ways and holy in all His works. What is the Lord? He's righteous. And he is holy in all of his works. Righteous, you see how he puts it down there? If he says your ways, that means your lifestyle. Let me ask you the question this morning. Is your lifestyle righteous? You need to practice righteousness. Oh yeah, no, no. We come to church on a Sunday preacher and you know, we come here and we ask the Lord to forgive us. But what are you walking back into after you walk out of this place? Is that a life of unrighteousness? This is what it means then. If he says the Lord is righteous in all his ways, it means our lifestyle and holy in all of his works. If I do a work that is a permanent thing that I do. And here he says it. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of God. I ask you again, how's your lifestyle? Who are you hanging out with? 
Oh, you know, preacher, I'm hanging out with those sinners because Jesus Christ went in there and he sat with sinners. Yes, I know. But he went there to change them and he preached to them. What? The gospel. Are you doing that? If you do that, praise the Lord. But if you hang around and you get hooked on, on their habits, then it's not helping anybody. It's for a start and not helping you. Because it will bring you down. You need to practice righteousness. Oh, you are such a legalistic church. No, we're not. There's a difference. The definition of righteousness means to be virtuous, honorable, or morally right. The things you do, are they morally right? Are they virtuous? Are they honorable? I want to make a statement here, and this is the statement that I went to, the, to Facebook to work. Righteousness is the root that grows out of the seed of faith. Think about that. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this word righteousness. Because I can, I can actually preach a few sermons on this. And this is important for us. So because some people say, you know, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven and I can do whatever I want to do. That's not true. You've got a responsibility. Because he said, if, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to do what? To forgive you those sins. Listen to me now. Past, present, future. I totally believe that the Lord already knows your sin that you're going to do two months from now. And he's already forgiven you for that. But here he comes now to the second part. But he will clean you from your unrighteousness. That means those habitual sins you do, the Holy Spirit will come to you and convict you, and you need to stop those sins as well. I know some people will get mad at me, but I'm going to say it how it is. You need to live a righteous life. You need to come to a point where after you are born again, your life changes. Your lifestyle changes. And this is what it means. Righteousness is like the root of, you know, some people come to me and they say, you don't carry the fruit. I'm, I, I'm not, I don't care about the fruit. Because the fruit will not be healthy if the root is not healthy. Are you with me now? And righteousness is that root underneath that people don't see. You can walk into this building, you can smile, you can give money away, and everybody says, oh, he's a lovely Christian. But inside of you, there's a different root. Everybody can fake the fruit, but you cannot fake the root. I put this onto Facebook, and uh, really interesting the responses I received. No, it was good responses. You see, we need to understand this, brothers and sisters. This is why the church gets so hung up about people who say once saved, always saved, or you've got assurance of salvation. It's because they, they do not ever come back to the Word and understand it. If God has saved you from your sins, if He's forgotten you, and He plant inside of you His righteousness, that righteousness needs to bear fruit. Whose fruit? His fruit. Not fake fruit. You know, I, I've got a story about fake fruit. I love green grapes, and some of you heard this before. Green grapes. In South Africa, they had Hanapuat grapes. Hanapuat grapes, I haven't tasted it in all parts of the world. It is a green grape, and it's a beautiful grape. Man, if you eat, one, if you eat a Hanapuat grape, man, you'd go, I want more. It's big grapes, it's juicy, it's sweet. And I love those. Now, it's also expensive, because it's so juicy and true. People know it's expensive. And, you know, we were nine children. My dad didn't always have money to buy it. And if he had it, I had to split it with six sisters and two brothers. So you only get but a little bit, you know, of those. So one day we went to my auntie's house. And little me walked up there and I saw on the table these Hanapur grapes. And I was in the mood for Hanapur grapes. <laughs> always in the mood, brother. And as the adults were all over there, I was eyeing these grapes. And I thought, what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm okay with the hiding. I'm okay with that, you know. I'm going to do the deed and give me the hiding. But at least I know I've had a little bit of the Hanapur grapes. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm measuring this up, I'm measuring everybody up, I see these grapes and I'm going, this is what sin does. It's the temptation of sin, isn't it? And I looked at this thing and I thought, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go up there, take the biggest mats as I can and just put it in. And eat and then I'll go, okay, go, I'll, I'll, okay, I'm ready. So I did this. Worked the plan and I went up there and I grabbed it and I put it in my mouth and it was plastic grapes. <laughs> Guess what, Anne? I did get the hiding. <laughs> what was that? I, I ruined it, yes. I absolutely, they were all coming off and there was a big commotion. And I got my hiding out of that. But what have I learned? You can fake the fruit, but you cannot fake the root. And here it is. It says, He is righteousness. Now let me ask you a question. When you get born again, who comes and lives inside of you? Holy Spirit. Is Holy Spirit part of God? He is God. Is He righteous? He is righteous. So what comes and lives inside of you, brother? Righteousness. He comes, we talk about the cloak of righteousness. I hope you grasp this. I see so many Christians, they work hard to be good Christians. I know of a man who took, you know, those fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. And he cut them out and he, 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 and he put them all around his house on the walls. So that if he walk up and he can see love, oh, I need to remember to do love. What am I going to do, do love? Patience, I need to do patience. No, no, that is producing your own fruit. It's producing your own righteousness. No, no, we need to get the righteousness of God in us, which comes in. And now we need to discipline our minds and our bodies to do the work of that righteousness. It is His fruit that needs to come through us. This is why I say righteousness is the root that grows out of the seed of faith. We get it by faith in Jesus Christ. And now righteousness starts to work in our lives. And this is a beautiful verse. My sister, I think you put it to me on, on Facebook and I love it. And you're absolutely right. Because look, let's look at Philippians chapter 3 verse 9. I know I'm taking a little bit of time on righteousness, but this is so good. Look at this verse, Philippians 3 9. He says, And be found in Him. Who's the Him? That is Jesus Christ. Okay? I typed it over with a small letter, but to be found in Him, this is where our faith is in. You see, the seed of faith comes from Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. You see? Now we contrast it, but that which comes through faith in whom? In Christ. Now look at this now. The righteousness from God. That depends on on faith how good is this how good is this oh, i'm going to work so hard to be a good christian yes i'm not saying you need to sit back yes the work we do now is we obey christ everything i do i say lord is this pleasing you everywhere i go lord is this pleasing you I don't go to places that don't please Him. I don't do things that don't please Him. That is your referee there. And I said to you, it's going to be, be a very, very noisy uh, slide. Look at this, Isaiah 61 verse 10. I hope you're okay if I just throw scripture verses at you. Are you okay with that? Yeah. I can't preach otherwise. If you want it otherwise, you need to need another pastor. I can't. I can't just give you the word, okay? Because when I read that, I go, it needs to come from the Old Testament. Why? Because I read about the law there. Then I found Isaiah 61. And you need to go and read the whole chapter. Because in the beginning of Isaiah, there's a prophecy about Jesus Christ receiving the Spirit of God. Okay? And then he continues on. He says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt my God. For he has, now listen to this now, he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. Now what is the garments of salvation? You read on. He has covered me with the robe of, he has covered me with the robe of, one more time, with the robe of, 
When do you get the rope of righteousness? What's that word there? Salvation. Salvation. When does He plant the seed of faith in you? At salvation. When do you get the righteousness? Salvation. Are you getting excited? Yeah. Are you getting thrilled by this? Is your joy, you know, going higher and higher? Look at this now. He sees this in the Old Testament. They had it. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headness, as a bride adorns herself in her jewels, for as the earth brings forth. Now look at this now. Look, look at my statement. Righteousness is the root that grows out of the seed of faith. Where do you get that? Look at this now. As the earth brings forth and it sprouts and the garden causes a, what you sow to sprout up. So the Lord God will cause righteousness and the praise to sprout up before all the nations. Shout hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand in this place. Come on. Come on. Why do we say that? Why do we say that? Look at this. Now I'm getting excited. I said to you before, the Lord God will do what? Everybody say that word. Cause. Who will cause? The Lord will cause righteousness and praise to sprout. What does the word sprout mean? It means something that grows. Wow. Woo! If there's one thing you remember as you walk out of this place today is righteousness. Practice righteousness to the nations. That's a full slide there, isn't it? Have you found your way through that, Vito? Yep. Now there's one more coming. <laughs> That's the thing. 1 John 2.29, if you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of God. We can't leave it there. I can't let you go. Sorry. I need to talk to you about practice righteousness. If I let you go now, you've only got half the story. You need to get it all. Look at this now. If you look at the first one here, He says in 1 John 3 verse 10, He says it right there. Where's my glasses? Oh, man. This organized. He says there, 1 John 3 verse 10, In this the children of God and the children of the devil. Wait a minute. There's two kinds of children here. You're either a child of God or you're a child of? There's no gray areas here. He says, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. What does the word manifest mean? You can see that. So now you can look at two people and you can say, oh, now I can see one is a child of God, one is a child of the devil. Don't go and fit it after the service, okay? Just, you, you've got to use this sermon. Look at this now. Whoever, everybody say whoever, whoever. does not practice righteousness is not of God. Wow. That is an indictment, isn't it? So does it mean we have to practice righteousness? And there I thought you sat and you said, oh man, I'm just going to make it into heaven. You're going to wheelbarrow me into heaven, pastor. You're in the wrong church. You better start work. But it's not the work that brings you to salvation. You're already saved. Look at this now. I'll hurry up. Proverbs 2, 21 verse 3. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than to do is more than sacrifice. And there you're sacrificing your life. You give everything, but you do not do righteousness nor justice, and it's not acceptable to Him. Let me quickly finish today. It says here now, look at this now, to practice, the, the, uh, to practice righteousness is to live a moral and ethical life that aligns with God's will. This involves doing what is right and just, being honest and truthful and treating others with love, kindness and respect. It means following God's commandments such as not lying, stealing or harming others and living a life that is pleasing to God. That's what I've written down during the week. I, that's, I formulated that and I wanted to read it to you. Of course, I can't repeat it again. And, you know, if you're on, on the mailing list, you will get these slides, so you'll see these scriptures. Now, Philippians chapter 1 verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of praise. So how do we practice this righteousness? How do we do that? We are filled with the fruits of righteousness that comes through 
Jesus Christ. We find this in John chapter 15 verse 4. You remember that passage? He says, abide in me and I in you. And as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither in me. Now I've, I've spent too much time on righteousness. And uh, I think I will pick up next week because I want to talk to you about God is love. But I'm going to stop there for now. I've gone on too long on righteousness. I will talk next week on God is love. I will talk about that, but then also next week, look, there is three. And we're, going to, we're going to look next week at the first five verses. And the message for next week is the word of life revealed. And we will see how God reveals himself and how he reveals himself to us. Have we learned something today? Yes. Are we practicing righteousness? Are you practicing righteousness? Or are you sitting here and you say, wow, I didn't know I need to do some work. Yes. Did you know that when, when the Lord Jesus Christ saved you, that you have a responsibility? Did you know that? And, <laughs> hey, listen, it's not the pastor. Hey, pastor, you need to get me into heaven. No, no. Hey, pastor, you need to practice righteousness. Yes, I need to. But so do you. So let's do one thing this week, okay? Just do one thing. Go and pray and say, Lord, show me areas in my life that I'm not practicing righteousness. Will you do that? And we'll see each other next week at the same place. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word, Lord. And Father, if there's anything in my flesh that came into this sermon, Father, I repent of that. Because, Lord, your word is powerful. It's living powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts between bone and marrow, spirit and soul, and it's the discerner of the heart. Help us, Lord, this week to practice righteousness. Your righteousness, Lord. I'm not going to try hard this week to, to follow law, Lord. I'm not here for law. I'm here for your righteousness. I pray this in Jesus' name.